This is Shelter in Place, a podcast about coming together in a world that pulls us apart. From Oakland, California to Hamilton, Massachusetts, I'm Laura Joyce Davis. When we moved to California 17 years ago, we knew almost nothing about the city we were moving to. But it was where I'd gotten into grad school and do a program I was excited about. And so we uprooted our lives in Minneapolis and transplanted ourselves to Oakland. It's an understatement to say that we were delighted by what we found. We hadn't known that we were moving to a place where the weather is rarely too hot or too cold, where hundreds of miles of trails snaked through redwood forests. But most of all, we hadn't known about the food. Alameda County is among the most diverse counties in the nation. And with that comes a whole lot of diversity in food. We discovered taco trucks and banh mi sandwiches and that California was a cuisine. My Nebraska farmer grandparents and my home ec teacher mom had instilled in me the value of cooking with good ingredients and starting from scratch. But now I was in a place where food was an obsession, a religion we could all belong to, a community gather where no one was excluded. Education brought us to California, but food made it feel like home. Food was how we made friends, the way we came to know ourselves in this new place. We cooked hundreds of dinners for neighbors, offered and received meals when babies came. Food brought people together in backyards and on church patios, in classrooms and on park benches. Food made the world feel expansive. There were endless possibilities. You're probably getting the sense by now that I love food. I love cooking it and learning about it and discovering it and most of all, eating it. Only when I tried and failed to make Ethiopian food for my family did I realize that in over 130 episodes of Shelter in Place, we never once done an episode about food. It's time to remedy that. Life's big questions can wait until next week. Today, we are devoting an entire episode to the importance of breaking bread, or in this case, injera. The first time I had Ethiopian food, I tried to have an open mind, but the spongy, sour tastes and textures were ones that I couldn't get used to. Over the years, I'd occasionally try it again, and each time I'd shrug and say, I guess this just isn't my thing. But when I was pregnant with my daughter, Matea, a friend showed up at my house with Ethiopian takeout. I hadn't known until I tasted it that it was exactly what I wanted. Suddenly, the flavor seemed just right. The place where my friend got takeout was called Darai Injera, named after the spongy, tangy bread that comes with every meal. Injera is an edible platter. It's both a vessel for holding food and a utensil, since it's typically eaten with your hands to scoop up the food served on top of it. Dare Injera was a family-run establishment, just one tiny room with bags of lentils and spice racks lining the walls. There was no place to sit, and they served just one thing for takeout. For $12, you could get their vegetarian combo, a meal large enough for two, with red lentils, yellow split peas, and collard greens, lovingly nestled into a huge circle of injera, wrapped up like a present. Darai injera became a Friday night treat that my kids developed an early taste for. We'd sit around the kitchen table, fight over the injera, and lick the lentils off our fingers. We stopped getting takeout after Nate lost his job a few weeks into the pandemic. Darai injera closed its doors, and the family went back to Ethiopia. Eventually, we closed our doors too. We've been calling this season of shelter in place Pandemic Odyssey, because after months of pandemic parenting, California wildfires, and distance learning, our family traveled from one coast to another to seek the support of extended family. We've often felt like Odysseus lost at sea, wondering if we'll ever get home. In September, as we drove through Nevada, Utah, Colorado, and Nebraska, I found myself craving Dare and Jira with an intensity I hadn't felt since I was pregnant. 
While Nate wheeled our minivan through northern Iowa, I searched on Yelp for an Ethiopian restaurant and realized only after Des Moines was an hour behind us that we'd passed the only place in the state that could satisfy my longing. Finally in Chicago, we found an Ethiopian restaurant where the guy at the counter gave me extra injera when I told him how much I'd been missing it. One of the few kitchen ingredients that traveled across the country with me is a small pouch of the spice mix berbere. I'd bought it in Oakland with the aspiration of cooking my newfound comfort food at home. Here in Massachusetts, the nearest Ethiopian restaurant is more than a half hour away, most of the way to Boston. But months went by and the berbere remained in my cupboard. I could cook pork belly confit or fried sage atop truffle risotto, but Ethiopian food, and injera in particular, intimidated me. I might never have made it if my sister-in-law hadn't come over one night and suggested that we give it a shot. While I looked up injera recipes, she chopped mounds of onions, garlic, and ginger. It took us nearly two hours, but the results were delicious. There was just one problem. My injera, that essential flatbread that everything else rested on, was flimsy and fragile and not at all spongy or sour. Nate recently recounted this story to one of our apprentices, Elin Tekle, when she told him that injera wasn't unique to Ethiopian cuisine. Eritreans ate it too. She said you'll often hear Ethiopian and Eritrean used interchangeably, because until the 90s, when Eritrea gained independence, it was part of Ethiopia. There are a lot of crossovers with the culture, and the food is basically the same. Elin didn't immediately know why my injera didn't turn out right, but she offered to ask her mom if she'd share her injera secrets, which is how we found our way to this episode. When I asked my mom about how she made her injera, she told me a story I'd never heard. My parents have lived in the U.S. longer than they have lived in Eritrea, but when they moved here back in the 80s, they were among the first Eritreans in Tucson, Arizona. They came with very little money and had no immediate family here to welcome them. Back when my parents came here, if you wanted to eat injera, you had to know someone. When they arrived, an Eritrean woman named Gennett gifted them with an injera starter, a little piece of home that she had brought with her and kept alive. My mom said if she didn't have that starter, she wouldn't have been able to eat injera. I mean, she could have, it just wouldn't have tasted as good. I love injera. Injera means comfort and family and tradition and home. It's an everyday food that you can eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. As Laura mentioned, injera is a sour, spongy flatbread. It's an essential part of Ethiopian and Eritrean cuisine, the base of every meal. I wasn't part of the sourdough craze at the beginning of the pandemic, but injera starter has a similar process, just with a different kind of flour. You combine flour and water, put it into a sealed container, and let the environment do its thing for at least three days until it starts to ferment, which makes that sour taste. Once there is naturally occurring yeast to make that mixture bubble and rise, you have to feed it with more flour and water to keep it alive. Once you have a starter, you mix it with flour and form your dough. We make our injera with teff, a dark brown ancient grain that's super tiny and fine but packs a bunch of nutrients. It's gluten-free and high in calcium, fiber, protein, and iron. Each village has their own grain. Some use wheat, barley, millet, or corn. You can mix and match. After you form your dough, you leave it on the counter for one day. The next day, you boil hot water and pour it into the dough to make a loose batter. At this point, you can leave it in the fridge for a day, or you can make injera now. It's cooked on a flat circular pan called a mogogo, sort of like a crepe, but you don't flip it. You cover the pan and steam cook the top. The porous texture looks sort of like a pancake, and when it's done, use a big straw mat to lift it off the pan. I know I just use sourdough bread, pancakes, and crepes to describe injera, but it makes sense when you see it. Cooks often use the same starter for years, allowing it to grow and develop, deepening in flavor as it matures. So when my mom makes injera, her starter has some of last week's teff, but it also has some molecules of the teff from a year ago, three years ago, 20 years ago. The memory of everywhere that starter has been is imprinted in every piece of injera she makes. The starter became hers, took on a life of its own, and provided our family, friends, and community with meals for 35 years. She still uses it to this day. 
My mom immediately knew why Laura's and Jetta didn't turn out right. Laura's recipe called for yeast. It hadn't even mentioned a starter. The minute you add yeast, my mom said, you destroy the taste. She said Laura could make her own starter, but it would be better if she got a starter from someone else. Maybe she can ask at an Ethiopian or Eritrean restaurant, she suggested, and then added, and if they won't give her some of their starter, I'll send her some. Elin says that when Gannett gifted her parents with some of her injera starter, she didn't just give her food. She threw them a lifeline. That starter said, welcome to your new home. There's a community here for you, a place to make a new start. As other Eritreans arrived in Tucson, Elin's parents gifted them with the starter the same way Gannett had welcomed them. Those connections became not just a way to preserve their culture, but to create a family. By the time Elin was born, the Tucson Eritrean community was thriving. Elin grew up surrounded by adopted aunts and uncles and cousins who began their own lives here with that same starter that had been gifted to Elin's mom. Boston chef Tim Chen, who spent years creating recipes at America's Test Kitchen, waxes poetic about Starter on the website Serious Eats. He says that what's frustrating about Starter is that there's not one perfect roadmap to success. He writes, you're dealing with wild yeast and bacteria cultures. No two cultures are the same. He says that a Starter is a living ecosystem and time, temperature, climate, and even your own two hands will affect how it tastes. A starter in Tucson will not be the same as a starter in Boston. It can take a while to figure out what your starter needs. And there's even such a thing as keeping your starter environment too clean. He writes, it's important to remember that as much as we want to keep things tidy and sterile in the kitchen, we don't cook in a vacuum. In fact, Cultivating a sourdough starter depends on this imperfection. But he quickly adds, but here's the truth. Making a starter is not that hard. Follow the basic guidelines, use your senses, and your starter will live and thrive. No matter what culture we come from, starter is a great metaphor for life. Whether we're in our hometown or someplace brand new, it can take some trial and error to figure out what we need to thrive. We have to adjust to our environment to remember that imperfection is all part of that process. But the truth is that making a starter in the kitchen or in life isn't that hard. It just takes a little help and time and experimentation to cultivate. That injera that Elin grew up with was a vessel for so many of life's essential moments. Its taste and texture connects her to her family, even when she's far from home. And this experience isn't unique to Elin. Every time I eat injera, I think about my friend Christine, who brought it to me when I was pregnant. About my sister-in-law, Hillary, who was there to cry over onions with me and make me laugh when I tried and failed to make injera for the first time. If I hadn't had that kitchen failure, Elin might never have learned from her mom that she'd been nurturing her own starter for over 35 years. And that's the thing about starters, about life. Sometimes it's the failures that finally show us how to thrive. Here's Michelle O'Brien, one of our shelter-in-place apprentices. Before the pandemic meant we couldn't gather, I started a cookbook club with some friends. It started as an excuse for us to cook elaborate dishes and show off our cooking prowess but it turned into a beautiful little community. Each month, we'd sit with friends and friends of friends on someone's living room floor, ooing and eyeing over each other's creations, relishing each bite. Like a starter, each iteration of that gathering evolved from the previous one, deepening our connection and widening the community. I can trace the impulse to gather people around a good meal to years of watching my mom in the kitchen. She was the first to show me how to cook, but also the first to teach me that making and sharing a meal with someone can be a tremendous act of love. I'm part Irish, part Jewish, both cultures of big, loud families, communal meals, and chaotic gatherings. On Jewish holidays, my mom or grandma would make brisket or latkes or matzo ball soup. And when we visited Ireland, granny and granddad would ply us with roasts, rashers, sausages, and plenty of spuds. For both sides of the family, it was rich, stick to your ribs kind of eating lots of fat and flavor, the kind of food that feels like a special occasion. 
but the food that I feel most connected to is one of the simplest, my mom's Friday night chicken. It's a whole chicken, roasted on a bed of potatoes and big onion chunks, showered with garlic powder and paprika. Mom would make it for Shabbat most weeks growing up. We lit candles, ate challah, said the prayers, even though we didn't actually observe a true Sabbath. I always loved her ritual of cleaning the chicken. She has a dedicated paring knife and apron for the practice, neither of which is to be touched aside from chicken cleaning at your own peril. I loved how happy it made her to be in the kitchen, singing to herself, ensconced in the ritual of making dinner for us, and how happy it made her to sneak little bites of the onion and potato gravy right from the roasting pan into her mouth as she puttered around the kitchen cleaning up afterwards. The idea of Friday night chicken, that there was a designated time and space for gathering every week, that a meal could be a gift to wordlessly express love, began my own love affair with food and cooking. It made the kitchen a place of routine and almost meditation. And the way my mom cooked, confidently, from memory, became an unspoken goalpost for adulthood. So this year, when I found myself apart from my family for Passover Seder for the second year in a row, I decided to finally make my mom's Friday night chicken. Somehow, in all of my years of cooking, I'd never made it myself. I'd mastered dishes that were far more complicated, so I figured this one would be a piece of cake, despite mom's minimalist instructions. I'm the one who orchestrates our family's Thanksgiving menu, after all, bossing around my parents and siblings in my relentless pursuit of deliciousness. As I cleaned the chicken and showered it with the requisite garlic powder and paprika, I imagined my mom's hands on the bird, the way she'd mimic her grandmother's New York by way of the shtetl accent as she cooked. And then you take an onion, fetch it in there, just like that. Delicious. You never tasted such a chicken. Come on, what's the matter with you? You don't like garlic? Everybody likes garlic. Oh, it's gonna be so good. I set the table with its Seder plate of symbolic bitter herbs, matzah, hard-boiled egg, and charoset, my apartment fragrant with the smell of Friday night chicken. I imagined myself nonchalantly hopping onto our Zoom Seder, juicy chicken pieces and matzo farfel filling my plate as I made all my cousins jealous and mom proud. At last, my oven timer went off and the bird came out of the oven and... It was the driest, most disappointing chicken I'd ever made. Borderline inedible. I've made less than perfect meals before, but this one stung. Maybe it was my oven's fault. Maybe I'd been overconfident with my improvements to mom's method. Maybe I didn't have the right kind of roasting pan. Maybe it just wasn't the same without that green flowered apron and paring knife. Or, more likely, without mom at the helm. It was humbling to realize that despite all of my kitchen triumphs, I'd somehow failed to absorb this one essential meal. But my failure also reminded me of how connected I still am to my mom. How lucky I am to have her in my life. That it's not too late to learn her secrets. From a certain perspective, my failure was a gift. It's wonderful to feel, after all these years, that there's still more my mom can teach me. Next time I'm home, I'll watch her more carefully in the kitchen and avoid the comedic distraction of her impeccable accent work. One of my favorite kitchen memories from childhood was making angel food cake with my mom. The tradition of making an angel food cake for birthdays came from my dad's side, but it was my mom who taught me how satisfying it could be to make something complicated exactly right. You had to gently spoon the cake flour into a measuring cup, never pack it down, and then sift the sugar and flour twice through a mesh strainer. There was smooth precision in the way that the back of the butter knife slid across the top of the measuring cup. No room for error in the separating of exactly one dozen egg whites from their yolks. One bit of egg yolk and the whole thing will be roined, my mom would say. She'd add, you have to have stiff peaks as we watched the egg whites and sugar churn into meringue. After 35 minutes of the kitchen filling with the scents of vanilla and almond extract, of sugar, in other words, of heaven, the cake would come out of the oven. But only hours later, after the cake had rested and cooled upside down atop an overturned glass, could we finally taste that cloud-like creation that was so moist and sweet that it didn't need frosting. As an adult, I prefer ice cream to cake, but that angel food cake is a rare exception. I still make it for birthdays. I made it for my daughter last month when she turned seven. Our first year in Oakland, Nate and his brother tried to surprise me with that cake for my birthday. They scoffed at the fussy recipe and didn't bother with sifting or careful measuring. 
They didn't even know what stiff peaks were. When I came home from work that evening and they proudly pulled the cake out of the oven, we all gasped. And then began laughing at the dense tan donut no more than an inch tall. Because that's the thing about food. We often don't realize how intricately it's tied to the people who shaped us until their guidance and instruction are no longer available. One of our apprentices, Samantha Skinner, learned that firsthand. I grew up in Texas, but my roots are also Korean. I can tell you who makes the best Tex-Mex, and our extended family gatherings included brisket as often as pulgogi. But the food that feels most tied to my upbringing isn't any of these, and it isn't Texan. My mom always told my sister and me how important it was to continue our Korean traditions to make sure we remembered and cherished where we came from. And the food that embodies those values most for me is tteokguk, a traditional Korean soup that you have first thing in the morning on New Year's. It tastes like pure, creamy comfort. I look forward to eating tteokguk every year. It's a time where my family makes a point to come together and where everyone's happy. As kids, we would bow to our elders and say, Sepong mani patuseyo, which means wishing you good fortune for the new year. Our elders would respond by offering wisdom and resolutions for the year. And the best moment was when they would give us the sebe, a folded wad of cash passed from their hands to ours. My sister and I would squirm in excitement until the ritual was over, stealing peeks at our palms and then giggling in our room when we could finally count the bills. My family doesn't practice many of the Korean traditions and holidays, but this is one we always stuck to, and it felt like a direct window into my Korean culture, a moment when I felt Korean. Like, look at me eating this soup that none of my friends know about, doing this traditional bow to my halmoni and harabaji, receiving wisdom in Korean, even if it needed to be translated by my mother. Most Korean people eat tteokguk on Lunar New Year's, but my family always had it on January 1st, I think as our way of combining our Korean and Western cultures. My favorite memories are of the times when my grandma, aunt, and mom all made it together. But mostly, it was a dish made by my mom alone, for my sister, dad, and me, since we lived in Texas and the rest of our family lived in California and Korea. The recipe evolved as we grew up, my mom created a vegetarian version after my sister and I decided to cut meat out of our diet. Even after I moved out of my parents' house to go to college in Austin, I would drive home every year to share the tradition soup with my family. That was until fall of 2018, when I moved to New York to attend grad school. On January 1st, 2019, I woke up and my stomach sank. I had completely forgotten about tteokguk, and I had no idea how to make it. The ladies on the Korean side of my family had always loved staking their claim on the kitchen, and the rest of the family just needed to stay out. It wasn't meant to exclude us, it was just their gift to us to create this meal and share it with the family. Because of this, I never learned how to make it myself. How could I have not thought of this sooner? I panicked. The idea of not having tteokguk felt so wrong. Like, bad luck for an entire year, and like being less Korean. Since the meal isn't usually made vegetarian, buying it at a restaurant wasn't an option. I realized, Samantha, it's time for you to learn how to make this. It's time to carry on this tradition and make it your own. So I called my mom and tried not to cry as I wrote down her vague instructions. She doesn't use measuring cups and exact temperatures, and it took me a few more phone calls to track all the ingredients down. But at last, I had everything I needed. I stood in my tiny Brooklyn apartment kitchen and stared at the notes I'd taken from my mom. I thought about her and my aunts and my grandma talking over each other in Korean and laughing as they crowded into the kitchen. And then I began. I soaked the rice cakes, I boiled kelp for soup broth. I scrambled the eggs and slowly added them in. Then scallions, soy sauce, sesame oil, dumplings, and at last the seaweed. 
Every time I added something, I tasted the soup, searching for something that I couldn't name, but I knew I would recognize. I set the table for my roommates, and we took pictures of the three of us huddling over our steaming bowls to send to my family, along with a text saying, Se pong mani pataseo. My roommates told me that my tokuk was wonderful, and I felt so proud of how it turned out, but my version was not an exact replica of the one I'd grown up with. I was using the same ingredients, but I couldn't put my finger on what was different. I think the difference I noticed was sonmat, a Korean concept that David Silber writes about in the Noma Guide to Fermentation. Sonmat means hand taste, and he says that it's an irreplicable quality imbued by individual cooks to their food. Just like that starter that Elan's mom had been nurturing for 35 years, my mom's tokuk had a distinct character. It had its own hand taste, one that would forever be hers alone. But even so, learning to make my own version still filled me with joy. It felt like an important piece of my identity had snapped into place, a connection to a culture that often feels pretty hard for me to grasp. And even hundreds of miles away from them, it made my family feel close. I still feel that connection every time I've made tokuk since. Each New Year's Day I make it, and each time it's better than the last. A little less imitation, and a little more my own. One day, I would love to make it for my family. Or at least stake my claim in the kitchen with them, so we can combine our sonmat and make the version of tokuk that brings our past and present together. In her essay collection, Crying in H Mart, Michelle Zahner writes about going to the Korean grocery store after losing her mother. She writes, Am I even Korean anymore if there's no one in my life to call and ask which brand of seaweed we used to buy? She continues, We're all searching for a piece of home, or a piece of ourselves. We look for a taste of it in the food we order and the ingredients we buy. When I think back on my family's pandemic odyssey, that cross-country road trip from California to Massachusetts, I can recall the specific meals that marked our voyage. The tears I shed over taco soup in Utah. The relief and laughter over a bounty of green vegetables in Denver. Stories were recounted over eggs and bacon in Grand Rapids. Hopes shared over giant ice cream cones in Ithaca. In every instance, that food connected us to people. It set the stage for long conversations. It anchored us, even as we were drifting. In Homer's Odyssey, most of the stories are told not in real time, but around the dinner table. Hospitality is a central theme, and ancient Greek culture operated on the assumption that friends and strangers alike would be greeted with open arms and a full table. It's how Telemachus welcomed the goddess Athena in disguise, without even asking her name. It's how Odysseus was embraced at countless ports and palaces where no one knew who he was. For Odysseus, and for Elin, and Samantha, and Michelle, and me, that everyday act of breaking bread, or injera as the case may be, is a gateway to friendship and family, to finding our way home. Food is community. It's one of the things I've missed most in this pandemic. I miss sharing a meal with my neighbors, I miss standing around the kitchen with my girlfriends while our kids play in the backyard. I miss laughing and telling stories while we wash dishes or chop garlic. I'm thinking a lot about food these days, about how it can be an act of love to share it with others, about how it can preserve not just our cultures, but our relationships. Food gives me vision for a post-pandemic future. Here's Elin again. Right before lockdown, I stopped by an Ethiopian market I've never been to and bought multiple cans of fava beans with the hope of making fool, a flavorful bean stew eaten with wheat bread. I was feeling intensely homesick, and I hoped that making this comforting breakfast dish from my childhood would make my family feel closer. I FaceTimed my mom to get step-by-step instructions, and a few weeks later, I FaceTimed her again, this time to make Fitfit, a spicy buttery bread dish. She was making it for breakfast too, so we cooked it together. From there, those FaceTime calls turned into weekly cooking sessions with my mom and sister. They were a rhythm I looked forward to, a ritual that made me feel less alone. In one of those conversations, I asked my mom if she ever missed or longed for someone's injetta that she grew up with. She paused and said, wow, 
I feel like I can hear this memory unlocking her mind. She told me about the time she went to her mom's hair braider to give her money, and while she was there, the hair braider gave her and Jetta to snack on. Quick side note, and Jetta with a little bit of salt is the best snack. It's so simple, but so satisfying. This was freshly made in Jetta, still hot off the clay. It was a shiny brownish red, something that my mom had never seen before, made from a different kind of grain. My mom said that just thinking about it, she could smell it. It was the best in Jetta she ever had, and the first and last time she ever ate it. My grandma tried to recreate it for her, but it wasn't the same. The food that I made while mom and I were on the phone was good, but it wasn't quite the same as when she made it. My mom never writes anything down. It's all in her head. You won't get an exact measurement from her. She's constantly experimenting. Even trying to get her in Jetta recipe, it was one part wheat, no, two part wheat, three parts teff, no, sorry, two parts teff, one part corn. And yet somehow everything she makes still tastes familiar and amazing. Maybe 35 years of cooking and family and community has injected my mom's starter with the warm enveloping comfort I associate with her cooking. Maybe her most important ingredient is the one I can't write down, the one that's impossible to replicate. When you're a kid, you take it for granted that the people and foods and traditions that bring you joy will always be there. Only as I've gotten older have I realized that no day is promised. My worst fear is not being able to preserve the elements my mom infuses into her cooking. Not just the actual ingredients, but the way she makes the food her own. I worry she'll be gone before I can recreate dishes that capture not just the flavors, but the stories and memories of my upbringing. I've tried to figure out how to absorb some of her wisdom, to pay attention while I sit on her kitchen counter. But every time I watch her cook, I get lost in her magic. I offer help without being helpful, too distracted by the smells that have made her kitchen home. When garlic hits a hot pan covered in oil, how it turns sweet when you add onions, and then something completely different when you add tomatoes. It's a smell that traps into my hair, clothing, and furniture. For those reasons, my mom has built an outside kitchen to stop her house from constantly smelling like onions and garlic. But now our neighbors have picked up the smell and can always tell when my mom is cooking. When we eat in Jetta, we'll use our right hand to strip off a piece, wrap it around some of the food served on top, and then put it into the mouth of someone else at the table. Then they'll strip off a piece and do the same for us. This is what we call gursha. Gursha means mouthful. It's an act of love and friendship. The elderly or guests at our table will often receive the first gursha as a sign of respect. The larger the gursha, the stronger the bond of that relationship. Obviously in this pandemic, gursha wouldn't fly. But as we're beginning to redefine our lives in a post-pandemic reality, I'm thinking a lot about food. When we cook for someone or bring them food, it's a way to say, I'm checking in on you. How are you? I'm thinking of you and want you to feel good. On my most recent trip back home, I was on a work phone call when an uncle interrupted it to feed me. In that moment, I felt his love for me, how he would make sure I was taken care of. But I also felt the echoes of tradition that had been handed down to me through generations of family and friends extending Gursha. We've been ending these episodes with an invitation. So today, I want to invite you to give yourself permission to let food be more than fuel. As we approach this summer and start to reunite with people we've been away from during the pandemic, how can we make our meals an act of love and friendship? A way to say, I'm checking in on you. How are you? I'm thinking of you and want you to feel good. Last week, a package showed up with my name on it. It was from an address I didn't recognize, but when I opened it up, I knew immediately who it was from. It was a glass jar with a brown, flaky powder inside. It was Elin's mom's injera starter. Even though she'd dehydrated it so that it would survive the trip from Arizona to Massachusetts, it was still very much alive. I rehydrated it, and for the next week, I fed the starter each day. I watched it bubble, made sure that the thick and gooey consistency was just right. Finally, a few days ago, I invited my sister-in-law Hillary over, and we made the injera once again, this time carefully following the instructions Elin's mom had given me. I was nervous as I made the injera, but also excited. The act of making it felt sacred. The smell of it was pungent and powerful, laden with memories that weren't mine, but that I felt honored to welcome into my kitchen.
I knew after the first one came off my skillet that it was working. The texture was just right. And when I tasted it, it had that sour and dusky flavor I'd remembered and longed for, but also something new. It was comfort and friendship and home, all wrapped up in one delicious bite. It was perfect. Our associate producers for this episode were Elin Tekle, Michelle O'Brien, and Samantha Skinner. Shelter in Place episodes are now airing on radio stations across the country, and station managers have told us that listener requests make a big difference in what they choose to air. If you'd like to hear Shelter in Place on your local public radio station, send them an email and ask them to air our episodes. Before we go, we want to thank one of our newest supporters. Melissa Lent, getting to welcome you into our first cohort of apprentices has been pure delight. Thank you for the heart you brought, not just to every episode, but to our team. We are better because of the work you did here, and you helped create the symbolic starter that is now being passed along to future apprentices. Even though we never got to share a meal together or even meet in person, you'll always be a part of this shelter-in-place family. To you, our listeners, we want to say thank you, because Shelter in Place is listener-supported, and we really couldn't do this work without you. Your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts help more people to find us, and your listener survey responses help us decide where to go next. If you'd like to support the good things happening here, including our apprenticeship program, where we're training the next generation of women podcasters and creative entrepreneurs, you can find information on how to donate to Shelter in Place on our website, shelterinplacepodcast.info. You can also join our community by signing up for our newsletter, where we pass along a little bit of symbolic starter behind each episode. Shelter in Place is part of the Herd at Media Network. The Shelter in Place music was created by Chase Horseman at Reactor Productions. Additional music and sound effects for this episode came from Storyblocks. Alana Herlands is our producer. Nate Davis is our creative director. Sarah Edgel is our design director. And our outstanding season two spring apprentices are Clara Smith, Samantha Skinner, Elin Tekle, Shweta Wabwe, and Michelle O'Brien. Until next time, this is Shelter in Place. I'm Laura Joyce Davis. And then you take an onion, fetch it in there just like that. And then you take an onion, you fetch it in there just like that. It's so delicious. Such a good chicken. You never tasted such a chicken. <laughs> Come on, what's the matter with you? You don't like garlic? Come on, what's the matter with you? You don't like garlic? Everybody likes garlic. Keeps the vampires away. It's good, it's good. <laughs> Ooh, it's gonna be so good. Ooh, it's gonna be delicious. It's gonna be so good. <laughs> a hood 